Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live brought to you by Crowcast here. Very strange feeling with the Crows out of contention for the season, but still lots to talk about. And joining me this evening is Peter J. How are you going, Peter? Good, mate. How are you tonight? Very well. And uh, Donkey, how are you, mate? Good, mate. Good to be you, with you and all the loyal listeners out at home and yeah, wherever very... they are. <laughs> wherever they are and of course we have nikki on with us tonight how are you going nikki back on tuesday nights back on tuesday nights but getting the band back together i'm uh, we're not sure where macker is hopefully he's feeling okay um obviously he had his eye surgery a couple of weeks ago so uh, whether he's feeling a little bit under the weather i'm not sure but uh, if you're listening in, Macca, he just forgot well that's a possibility he is a very old man um, but, uh, Nikki, what we'll do this evening is Macca does a sweets and smacks later on in the uh, show, so you might just want to uh, take the cockwomble hat off and put the uh, Macca's sweets and smacks hat on for later on. <laughs> well, we still need the cockwomble. Yeah. Because there's, there's, there's definitely some oh, some nominees this week. Definitely. But if we, do, if we do that, we've got to start now, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. In the meantime, let's get right into it with a bit of Crow's news, shall we? Well, the big uh, news, I guess, coming out of the Crows this week has been the appointment of Marty Matner. It was a bit of a funny one. The uh, Sturt Football Club um, gave a uh, press release uh, on uh, on Monday morning and um, got ahead of the craze a little bit, but uh, they caught up by about 11 o'clock in the morning and um, and released the news. So uh, it was a really really um, good appointment, I think. Um, obviously, uh, uh, two flags with the uh, with the Blues. Been to Sydney, development coach there, great record on the field as well. So I think that's been um, a really a good pick up for us. So I think that that in terms of um, the Crows, that's really the uh, the main news that we've had this week. Was everyone happy with that appointment? Very Certainly much so. Oh, the one thing I liked is that there's the little stat of he's won a premiership as a player in the SNFL and as a coach, and he's won a premiership in the AFL as a player. So come on, Marty. We, we just need the other one so you can get the, the, the nice little set going there. Fiend, you're a blue man. What uh, what do you think? Yeah, well, uh, you can't have too many Sturt people on board, in my opinion, Pete. Um so, uh, but you know, every report you hear uh, from the from the Sturt Football Club and previously from Sydney and obviously from Adelaide in the past has all been very positive about Marty. And uh, he's a people person, and he's a very good communicator, and he uh, he brings people along. So, uh, my main hope with Marty is they actually utilise his uh, his strengths and and not just having. You know, sitting there as a, a line coach without much other input, I hope they actually use his experience and his strengths and uh, uh, it's a mutually uh, beneficial relationship. No, I agree, mate. I, I will, um, I'll, I'll throw one in for Macca. I couldn't agree more. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> that would be like uh, we'd, we'd like to see it go. So it's particularly after losing Josh Franco and the circumstances that we did, um, we hope that, um, as you say, that... Uh, He's given a good opportunity there to uh, to show his wares. Um, not a lot of other crows news news about it. It's been reasonably uh, quiet. Um, there has been a little bit of um, a few ripplings about CM and uh, the AFL investigation. That's still, I think, ongoing. Uh, there seemed to be a little bit of backing off in, in the media. Um, over the last week or so, so I think everyone's just backing off now and waiting for the uh, the AFL um, uh, integrity unit to uh, do their investigation and uh, and let us know what is going to happen. So that's reasonably quiet as well. There's been a little bit of other news going around with player movement. Dan Hanabry has uh, has just come out, um, uh, I think, late today, and said that he's now re- uh, formally requesting a trade from Sydney. Mm, so that will be an interesting one to watch. Um, and um, I think uh, I think it was only across the last week that Lockie Neal came out and said that he wanted to trade up to uh, to Brisbane. That seems to be the word. Um, so yeah, a couple of uh, reasonably big midfield names on the move. And uh, Geelong also fairly heavily into uh, Luke Dowhouse as well. 
Um, so apparently that's uh, been for a couple of years now that they've been into him and uh, even enlisted Dangerfield to uh, quietly court him over the last few months. So uh, Geelong certainly will be looking to trade in, I think, considering uh, they don't have much in the way of draft picks, but you wonder what their currency is going to be. They've delisted, how many, they delisted like about 11 players or something, didn't they? Well, wasn't, wasn't there six today or something? Uh, yeah. Eight, I think it was. Eight. Oh, yeah. there we go, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, the, the thing is that there were also little rumours about Danger is apparently using him to also kind of spruik trying to get, Jack. I think, Jack Steele from St Kilda. Jack Stephen. Um, Jack, Jack Stephen. Yep. Um, yeah. Oh, there's too many Jacks there. Um, and it's like, I'm, I'm with you, Phoenix. How are they going to do this? Because they actually have to trade players out. And if they've delisted all these players, you can't, what are they going to why would you bother trading for a player that's been delisted? Um, I just think it seems a bit ridiculous on Geelong's part there. There's one player that, uh, there that looks to possibly be on the move, and he's related to the Lockie Neal trade, that being Lincoln McCarthy. Apparently he is a very close friend of Neal, and uh, Brisbane are looking to um, get him up there as well as a kind of a, you know, reunite the friends and make that a bit better deal for Lockie to look at. So that was a little bit of news going around as well um, that uh, he could be one player, but I wouldn't imagine he would command too much by the way of a return draft pick. Um, So I think um, the only player of perhaps of interest that was dealers today was Corey Gregson, who I'm not sure what quite what happened to Corey. He, uh, he burst onto the scene a couple of years ago as a Mm. small forward and looked like he was going to take the world by storm. He's a South Australian lad. And, um, uh, just hasn't uh, been able to uh, sustain the uh, the effort. Yep, he or was in was my son's year at uh, Sacred Heart and he did burst onto the scene, Pete. So it'll be interesting to see whether there is any uh, in- interest in him. Uh, I think he got probably overtaken by um, by a couple of blokes there, Cockatoo and uh, more recently probably Tim Kelly um, in that yeah, sort they're of all taller small than mid, him. Yeah, small mid sort of role forward mid sort of role so I don't know but he's, he's a good young kid so uh, hopefully he gets he's only 22. Yeah. He's only 22 he's only a young lad I'm not sure if he's had any injury or whether it was just form or just um, not quite able to uh, um, keep his place but uh, he may be um, as a delisted uh, player he may be of some interest to um, the Adelaide clubs oh look Paul will pick him up <laughs> they like <laughs> they like picking up you know the, the people on the scrap heap, don't they the missing links, mm. yeah, God. Uh, no more word on Pollock either. That's gone a bit quiet. Um, That's gone very quiet, yep. I thought yeah. I saw on some, one of the Facebook pages today that he's locked in for North um, at uh, 3,000,075 over five years. And the sticking point for Port was they didn't want to give him five years. Yeah, it's it's an extra, what, 700,000 uh, with an extra year, so... Yeah. I don't know. Good on him, I guess, for uh, landing someone. But uh, I don't know whether I'd pay that for Pollock, would you? Well, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary situation at Port Adelaide when you've got a, you know, a, a player who will probably finish, you know, he will probably win their club champion or be at, at worst in the top three. He's had a very good year. Um, and it's extraordinary that they are not going to, effectively not going to be able to keep him. And they've got, you know, all of these players running around on fat, you know, contracts, um, you know, Watts, Motlop, um, Rockcliffe, um, you know, Dixon, you know, all of these right, all of these guys that they've bought in over the last, you know, three, four, five years. And then you've got Polak, who was another <clears throat> guy they traded in, and um, they're going to lose him because they can't effectively can't afford to uh, – it's not I, – I suspect that it's not that just that they can't match, that they can't get in the ballpark. You know, a lot of those players – I mean, he was a player that came back to Adelaide because he was homesick. So you would imagine if they could have got into the ballpark, he probably would have stayed. But obviously they're not even close. Well, and the, the irony is, and, and probably uh, the black mark on Port's recruiting has been that they – Pollock is exactly the type of player they can't afford to lose. They have so many inside Smaller. grunt midfielders. They need yep. some silk on the outside. And bringing in Rockcliffe, I think, for them has been a real mistake. Um, I certainly rated Rockcliffe uh, when he was in Brisbane. 
but he really was the wrong type of player for them and it, it's almost as if they got a sniff that the Crows were interested or, you know, apparently interested at some stage and they've just gone harder and, you know, I, so you've you've got to maintain some sort of balance in your list and at the moment Port's list looks so imbalanced that they, ha- they lack quality in defence and they lack some outside pace and... You know, Dixon really is a, a one-man band up forward and they're slowly killing his career just by kicking it on his head all the time. So I, I really don't understand the method to Port's madness uh, with regards to their recruiting over the last five years and now they're reaping what they sow with Pollock, I reckon. Mm, indeed. And, and it's going to come back double double kicking them in the bum when in two to three years' time, all those draft picks that they've traded away to get these blokes that that are going to be expiring and on fat contracts and force other people out, they're going to they're going to they're going to double crash. Yeah, yep. it was really poor, um, and and we've talked about this I think over the past two years that their their trading in just seems ridiculous. They they go for the quick fix, but they go for the quick fix with the wrong type of players. And the fact that Pollock was not only – he was a Port Adelaide boy because he grew up supporting that club. That was the whole thing. We might have been interested in him, but he was not interested in going to anybody but Port Adelaide. They then bring in Voss, and there and there's long been rumours that that was an issue um, up there with him in Brisbane that he didn't get on with Voss, who was his head coach at the time. They then bring him in. They then extend Voss's contract here and Pollock's going, okay, fine, I'm out. Um, I did see somebody, though, um, kind of mention that his wedding, that there's absolutely no poor players invited to it. That was Ooh. bizarre, wasn't it? And apparently, yeah, so I don't know how true that is. Apparently that. none of them that, invited to his engagement party either. No. And he, he was best buddies with um, Brody Smith. But since he actually came back, that kind of hasn't. They'd kept in touch, but um, I don't. They definitely. I think Brady kind of dumped him for Laddie, um, <laughs> but that seems to have gone quite sour as well. So yeah, don't know what's going on there. Mm. The other uh, bit of news I just wanted to uh, bring up was um, if, in looking at movers and shakers uh, for the upcoming draft. Did anybody catch Connor Rosie's game on Sunday? For North Adelaide against Sturt, he had 24 possessions, 10 marks, four rebound 50s, a couple of inside 50s, and um, he was very, very good. I hadn't seen him play fully before, yeah. but he really, really shone, and um, he is uh, in the draft charts with a bullet, and it would be very, very surprised if he lasts past pick 10. He bit us on the bum a bit, Pete, uh, bit us as in Sturt. And, um, yeah, uh, look, uh, not only that, did you, uh, I wasn't overly impressed with Lukosius, uh so far in the final series. Um, and I think it just goes to show that um, if you put the four big South Aussies in the frame, you can't go wrong with any two of them, really. Um, no. Yeah. Ha- ha- Haley for, for the Bulldogs is equally a, a fantastic young player. Uh, Connor had a great game. Uh, on the weekend uh, and was really influential and we know what Lukosius can do and obviously we know what Isaac Rankin's uh, skills and abilities are as well so all this hand wringing about trying to get Jack Lukosius I still maintain that it may not actually fit our list profile uh, you know ironically just talking about Port and the way they've managed their list we we may well decide that Rankin and, and one of Haightley and Rosie is going to be just good for us yeah, we may well. It's, it's going to be very, very interesting. Very interesting to watch how that draft plays out. And also, it's going to be a very interesting uh, trade period as well to see how we can, uh, because I suspect that we're not going to be looking, unless, other than potentially a Ruckman, and I know that they're talking about, um, I've heard some you know rumours about Bruce and potentially and Rory Lobb and potentially trying to attract a Ruckman. But I think that other than that, I can't imagine us getting involved in any player trading other than to um, get ourselves up uh, up the draft order. So I think that we're going to, that's that I would imagine um, will be our strategy. And so it'll be interesting to see where we end up at the end of trade period and what picks we've got. Yeah. And then of course we've got live trading to factor in as well this season, which is going to make the draft 
very, very interesting uh, to see how that plays out. At at the moment, it's hard to really picture how that's all going to work, but you can you can just imagine that there's so many different strategies played out on whiteboards all over the country in every AFL club. Um, you know, all these different connotations and what-if scenarios and, um, you know, if you're a recruiting <clears throat> manager at the moment, you're really earning earning your stripes, I reckon. And I, I think really, too, uh, one of the one of the key areas that the AFL competition is going to grow is in this talent and identification. And I think uh, I, I actually like the fact that uh, there's live trading in the draft this year and, um, you know, a few more opportunities to mess around because uh, there'll be some money ball pickups this year, I reckon, because it's that deeper draft. Um, mm. And... You know, it probably bats down to really about thirty-five before it starts to taper off. Um, well, that and, young lad from North Woodcock was being talked about as a rookie pick, and you yeah. know, he, he had twenty odd disposals and kicked a couple of yeah. and one snag in particular was a cracking goal. Yeah, there's a lot of quality around. Uh, Valenti from North as well is a quality kid, um, under eighteen captain. <clears throat> McAdam from your boys. Yep, um, looks to be there's, there's a lot of them around. Yep. So uh, it's going to be, and a lot of these blokes are going to go under the radar a little bit because not all of them got uh, invited, uh, or not all of them got picked up in this in this uh, state squad. State team, yep. yeah. Uh, some of them didn't make it, and they've had good back ends of the season. So uh, very interesting to see how across the South Australian talent Victoria is, because I think it's probably the strongest year. Uh, age group that we've had for a very 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 long time not only in the top 10 or 15 but also down the order a bit mm, indeed what else you got pete the crows picked up Gee, about 630,482 ambassadors uh <laughs> Did we? Yeah, haven't heard that one no we we appointed 11 new ambassadors 11 do we know who they are yeah, it's listed on the uh, AFC website, and uh, they're all from uh, marginalised backgrounds, I guess, or from people who represent marginalised backgrounds. We've got the African Women's Federation represented. We've got Relationships Australia. Or we've got the Hungarian community. We've got Anglicare. We've got the Australian Refugee Association. What do you reckon that's all about? We're trying to pick up around the edges, aren't we? No, 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 no. I th- that would tie in with a lot of our community work we've been doing. Hmm. Well, we do have. Um... They're trying to they're trying to mine different, more diverse sectors of the community. I suspect, mm. um, and and trying to sort of branch out from their rusted on sort of membership and those that they would normally, you know, attract um, into the world of, of supporting an AFL football club. And they're going for more, you know, diverse, um, you know, and I'd imagine as, uh, you know, particularly if they're, um, uh, if they're, you know, law- giving ambassadorships to, you know, refugee organisations, then, you know, people that are, you know, landing but in that's... Adelaide, they, they probably get a badge and a, a Crows badge and a, and a Crows kit and bag as soon as they get off the plane. That's where that ties in with a lot of that multicultural push um, and the academies, et cetera, that the AFL are doing. Just looking at the list of um, where they're from here, I do know that we do do some work um, with things like, like Angler Claire, um South Australia and Relationships Australia, um, those other ones. So you've got the Crows Next Generation Academy, so somebody who's already working in there. Um, and and that whole the multicultural program that that AFL is pushing, so that's where you tap into the refugee association, mm. um, etc. So to me, it's it's a smart move. Um, well, we do have a dedicated multicultural liaison you, officer now too. So yeah, because that's what I hear. Um, they will attend match day events, assist with the club's multicultural strategy and initiatives, and support the club at a community community level. Well, I've got to work on with those. The reality is, is that is that they're not going to grow this game overseas. So it's not going to happen, and um, I don't think. And um, so they, I guess, you know, they're in terms of growth strategy, they've got to, you know, continue to look 
within Australia, and I suppose that they've, you know, and that's why they're trying to get into Greater Western Sydney and the and the Gold Coast and these sort of places. And you know, um, I guess that that's that would be part of uh, the growth strategy, in, an yeah. internal growth strategy, if you like, or a domestic growth strategy, rather than um, you know spending dollars in places like China, which is a total waste of money and time. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean you, only, you only have. To look at the the number of kids um, from Afri- African refugee kids that are actually coming through the S NFL ranks, you look at what Ali Ali has been actually been able to do in Sydney this year. There's a hell of a lot of like athletic talent there, and if you can grab them early on and get them away from soccer, which is where a lot of those kids are focused on because it's such a huge sport back in Africa. Yeah, do it. I think yeah. it's really it really is a heart and mind thing, isn't it? And uh... You're right, Pete. I think it's, you know, just... I mean, the, one of the things that the Crows has done really well over the last 12 to 18 months is really try to expand the supporter base and, and the reach, I guess, with the brand. And, you know, a lot of people will thumb their nose at uh, Legacy Esports or, or the uh, the baseball club or whatever. But, you know, they're not huge spends by the club and they are uh, proactive in terms of trying to broaden their reach. And you can't really criticise them for that. Yeah. yeah. Is there an all-pair ambassador as well? Oh. <laughs> yeah, seems like we're hitting all well, the same well, markets. I think no, I th- there's, there was no, there's no French or uh, Mexican. Uh, yeah, yeah, once no, Peter um, Dutton gets a flick, and, he'll uh, get picked up. Yeah, and we're, and we're not into the polo ponies either. Yeah, no, worries. and no, um, and no away games in the Roo. That's the only two no, situations I've got. <laughs> Uh, the other thing too is we had a couple of re-signings too, Pete, during the week. We had uh, Benny Davis, Lockie Murphy, and Patrick Wilson all getting extensions. Uh, yeah, of course that was a, that was good news. I, I was really pleased for uh, for Ben Davis. I'm a big fan, and um, yep. just I, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stick my neck out like I would with uh, with Elliot Himmelberg, but I, um, I you know there is certainly some talent there, and and if he can harness that and uh, put in a good preseason, then uh, yeah, he. He, you know, his upside is is huge, and uh, really, also really impressed with Lockie Murphy's year this year for a kid coming on off the rookie list for as young as he is. He's only nineteen years old, and I thought for his first season of AFL football, I, I thought he was terrific um, this year. Couldn't agree more, Pete. Couldn't agree more on Murphy. It was just so <laughs> exciting to watch. I figure I've got to pick up the drinking game for everyone now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be He's a dry argument, that. otherwise, isn't it? Gee, yeah. Burton's a dickhead, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I do have to agree with um, Pete. Um, the, we've both been quite strong on Himmelberg and on Davis. Davis just, unfortunately, his injuries haven't kind of helped him. I think he's he's struggled a little bit at that level um, of just getting that body consistently right. Uh, but he did come to us, and he had an injury issue, so we knew exactly what we were getting. But there's some really nice tricks he's got. He's not as tall as McGovern, but he does that same similar kind of. He's quick. He's got a great leap. He's a real contested kind of ball winner in the air, or at least he tries to. Nicky, if it, you you know as well as I, if if that kid gets his career off the ground, he will be an absolute rolling highlight reel. Oh God, yes. Mm. Now, Jay Mac makes a good point in the uh, in the Spreaker chat. And g'day to everyone in Spreaker and on Facebook joining us today. Um, that Matna, because I, I guess the only re-signing that I was a little bit curious about was um, Wilson, Paddy Wilson. Uh, and uh, J-Mac makes the point rightly that uh, it'll be a reuniting of Paddy Wilson and Marty Matna at the Crows. I'm a little bit confused by how they see Patrick Wilson or where they see him or as a mature age recruit, where his development lies. Do you guys have any thoughts on Paddy Wilson? I'm going to, this is, I, I have no knowledge of this, but I'm just going to take a guess. Um, I think that Cam ellis will want to trade and I think he'll probably go. And I suspect that um, Patrick Wilson was given another year. Was it a year or two? Um one, I Sorry. think. Uh, da, da, I reckon he's probably da, 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 been given. Uh, he's been given another year to anchor that midfield in the sandfall, and if he if he develops, then you know, well and good. But he's he's a you know a body um, in the uh, with Camillus Yolman going. I think that he's sort of a big body depth player. That's as I see it. That's my guess. 
Yeah, I, I can't quite see how many he got, but it, it would have been an extra year, you would have thought. Um, and you're probably right, Pete. Yeah, they're, on, they're, quite, they're quite, on the rookie list. Yeah. With Murphy and Wilson, so you presume that's only a single year. Yeah. you'd. I, I wouldn't mind betting Lockie Murphy gets upgraded, actually, depending on how our list structure ends up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I must admit I was a little bit surprised that Paddy stayed on the list. But, um, you know, given given your thoughts on Cam Ellis Yeoman, and I, I, I tend to agree with you again without any real knowledge on the situation, Pete, um, then that makes sense, doesn't it? I think with Cam, we've got this currency for him. Um, I do think that Pike actually does like him, but unfortunately with we can't play him, we can't play Hugh, we can't play Matt Crouch all in there together, unfortunately. And I, I think Cam deserves a go at AFL level. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it, if it's... It's going to be sad if it isn't with us, but I would really love him to continue his career on it um, at least somewhere. I've really liked Wilson in the SANFL because every time he comes off the ground, he is utterly spent. He gives everything when he is out there. Um, we did see that where we used him when we put him in, in the Hawthorne game is we actually used him on the wing. So that'll be interesting as to whether we use him as a wing rotation and then into the midfield, if he, if that's where they're seeing it. Look, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, it looked like they were agree playing with you him on, out of position. Absolutely agree with you on Camelus Yolman, Nicky. I, I would always been a fan, and and I, I would, um, and I know that. Actually, just second thoughts on that, Fiend. We did hear uh, Treaders dropped a rumour, didn't he, saying that Cam was looking to yep. be traded out. So there might, that might have been in my subconscious. But I, um, I genuinely hope that he finds a home and he gets an opportunity to um, to carve out a career because he's not, you know, in, in only what be mid twenties. He's not an old man. He should could still have a hundred games left in him. So um, yep. I hope that happens he has Cam. had. Is this this was his second knee or was it his third? Second, I think, because he when we when we first picked him up, he we actually we picked him up on the back of a knee reconstruction. Because so we, yep. we actually set out that first year. Mm. I reckon he's a um, he's a prime trade trade you know value adder for us if we're trying to get up the draft. Like you know, yeah, yeah I think so. Whether whether a St Kilda we limb. give a St Kilda a you know the Melbourne pick and and him and we take theirs or something like that. So I, I actually think that's where we'll use him. Yep. And I think the Saints are a good match for him too. And I don't think that, um, you know, all things being equal, I, I really can't see Wilson playing league football next year. Um, but, you know, if we uh, if we cop some injuries like we did this year, then then maybe. Yeah. But, that, but that's why I want Cheney on the list. You, you need, or I'm very happy for us to possibly give Otten another year on the proviso that you're going to spend most of the year in the SNFL, but you know when they step up, you're going to get a good AFL performance out of them. Yep. And that's what you need on your list. Yep. Yeah, interesting that we haven't had any news on Kyle Cheney yet. Other than we, we know that he was in dispute with the club uh, over his contract, um, but uh, hopefully that uh, uh, will go away. And um, I'm a big fan of Kyle Cheney. I think he's a good footballer. So I'd, yeah, I agree. I'd, I'd, be hoping he'd, I'd be hoping he stays. I agree. He stepped in and did a job seamlessly for us this year and we would have been worse yeah. without him. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I think that might be it for news. What do you reckon? We'll move on to maybe yep. the finals. Uh, played like there were some finals last week. There was one. weren't running but a few clubs were well you're right nikki um there was one final um and if you're alluding to what i think you're alluding to <laughs> the last there was one game. there was one good game of footy on saturday night and the rest of it was putrid um i turned off the other three absolutely oh, i got bored putrid, you know either i mean the the melbourne geelong game was just one of the most god-awful games of football you'll ever see um and uh, sydney GWS not much better and um you know, Richmond Hawthorne was 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 predictable. 
all, all the results were fairly predictable, really. Um, uh, other than the fact, I mean, I know that the one that I missed was I thought Collingwood might get up over there. Um, they yeah, they were same. brave, um, but they didn't quite get the bickies. Um, although I thought they played pretty well, and it was it, that was actually a really entertaining game of football. Yeah, yeah. I. I I, I um West Coast is surprising me. I thought they'd fall off the fall off the boil a bit when Nick Nat went down, and then when they lost, um, yeah, uh, yeah the the Boston Brawler, and um, I yeah they they're surprising me. They've just got people pulling from all over the place, so it's really good to see those guys um, buy because you know it's just uh it's good to have a, a couple of non-Victorian teams still pumping. I I think you we've kind of seen that Danger doesn't do well in finals. Um, he's just proved that. Uh, it's, I sat and watched him live at the uh, our Hawthorne final, and he's just not interested. He was not interested in chasing. He will, His player will get a break, and then he'll go, oh, I have to put in, but it's a pretend put in. And so many times I saw that again in that Melbourne um, Geelong game. If they didn't have Tim Kelly out of there, they would have been, oh, him and, him and Ablett kept them in the game. Um, apart from Melbourne missing, but if they didn't have those two players out there, I mean, the fact that Ablett had a go at Selwood for doing something stupid, I quite enjoyed that. Um, I reckon Chris Scott's in a bit of trouble next season. The only He's won a premiership, obviously, but that was on the back of a, a, a squad built by Bomber Thompson. And, yep. and he, he admitted done hell... he didn't coach. Yeah, yeah exactly. And... He hasn't done a hell of a lot since, and they've done some uh, Port Power style recruiting uh, with Henderson and a couple of others, and uh, Ablett and whatnot, and haven't really made that squad any better. In fact, probably imbalanced it, if anything. Uh, Hawkins not getting any younger, uh, lacking down back, Harry Taylor on the way out. Oh, I reckon they're in strife, and I reckon Chris Scott might be under the pump next year if they don't lift. Yeah, PJ Crows pointed out, he just got a two-year extension. Yeah, I don't think that means anything. Yeah, absolutely read my mind, Fina, and I was just thinking this that very, very same thing when we were talking about Port Adelaide. I was sitting here thinking to myself, you know, Geelong, not that much different the way that they've gone. They're, they're two teams which seem they, they seem to think that, um, um, that there's no need to uh, spend too much time at the draft and that uh, it's better, you're better off... Uh, Chucking your draft picks around, uh, trying to top up on um, on experienced players, and they, they are two teams that, to me, really have not um, hit the draft uh, to any kind of success in the last probably you know, I don't know, two to five years, I suppose. They, sure. they you know, they. I agree, and I think I think Pete that they um, they're not even the best examples of doing it right. Whereas you look at someone like Hawthorne, who's probably traded away a few of their early picks, but they've picked up blokes like Mitchell and O'Meara, so. You know, they put them, they put basically A graders straight back in. Whereas, you know, if you're just picking up fringe, fringe players or lower in 22, then what's the point in giving away those picks? Yeah, true. Do you and reckon yeah, there's so any you coincidence? Their fan Go on, Nick. That they, yeah, they spruik about their recruiting manager, about how good he is. Yeah. Because well, he got them Selwood and all these other ones. It's like, yeah, father son picks. I was going to say. And help from the yeah, AFL. Them and the Bulldogs both benefited from father sons. Uh, do you reckon there's any coincidence that both Port Adelaide and Geelong are very sensitive about their memberships? I mean, Geelong have just uh, had a massive refurbishment of that stadium. Um, and need to fill it in an area where uh, socio-economic downturn has been experienced. And you've got Port, who have been scratching for numbers, you know, since probably 2014, really. Um, and it just strikes me as interesting that both those clubs seem to have gone for the Band-Aid approach and try to keep themselves up into the eight. Um, and Chris Scott coming out again recently and saying, you know, there's no, no value in bottoming out and getting picks because it's such a long turn around it that may not come to fruition uh, I just wonder whether there's some external pressure on that recruiting department to keep trying to at least maintain that competitiveness in, in the Cats defence at least they were rebuilding a machine that had actually just won some premierships so you know there's, there's investing in that machine trying to keep it ticking rather than rebuilding it's got more merit than, than what Port did which is try to reinvest the machine that was proven to go nowhere there's also another nice parallel in that you've got both the premiers of the states at the time were massive supporters of both of those teams and provided a lot of government funding to them. 
So the, the redevelopment at Geelong was pushed entirely by the government of Victoria at that time who had a Geelong supporter as their premier. And we know the the assistance that was given to um, Port Adelaide and and all the spruiking that was being done that if if you vote for certain people, then we get to upgrade our, our own facilities, et cetera, and things like that. So I think there's another layer of pressure in that you're getting government funding. You have to put runs on the board. Oh, I think, I think the three marginal states in Geelong got them their money, but yeah, anyway, different story, different day. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of that, but there's, 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 it's that nice, that feel good story of we're, we're helping them out kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Aren't we nice? Yeah. The other interesting, um, uh, uh, half of that equation, uh, on Friday night was Melbourne. I'd be interested where your thoughts are, because speaking of teams that we compare to Port Adelaide, I, they just seem to remind me a little bit of the Port Adelaide of five or six years ago when they made that prelim final. They're a, a team that kind of don't do a lot for, you know, three and a half quarters, but they seem to just each game be able to manage a burst where they're completely and utterly unstoppable and they manage to be able to sort of bang on five or seven goals. I know I've spoke about this through the season when we we're talking about Melbourne. and They're just this burst team that, and you never know when it's going to come. It might come in the first quarter or the second or third or the last, but they, they just seem to be able to pull out a five or six goal burst um, every game and it just seems to be enough for them to uh, to sit on that and then um, and get a win out just seemed to be how it played out. Um, anyone think that they could potentially go all the way? I certainly don't think so, but um, any other thoughts? They work hard, Pete, and I think the, the notable thing about Melbourne this year is that they're not falling behind, and you're right, they do have those bursts during games, but they rarely find themselves five or six goals down in a match this season. So mm. they're always sort of in the hunt and when they do yep. get it on a bit of a uh, tear and Oliver gets off the chain and uh, you know they've benefited certainly from Jack Viney coming in that was a very good gamble by by Melbourne Selection Committee um, look I reckon they make a prelim I, I think they're almost almost along with Richmond the, the form side of the final series I Hello. think my, my problem yeah my problem with uh, Melbourne though is that they still whilst they keep they keep pushing their pepper and and pepper the goals etc they do get those long runs where they just kick points um and if you are going up against somebody like Richmond who put, who do supply that maniac pressure again I don't think I think they may get slightly blown away um, in that instance, with a, a team like that, um, that that's that's my problem with with Melbourne is that, that they're just they're finishing. So whilst you're right about that that whole push, uh, the pressure that they do, etc., it's there's still a bit of a mess up forward at times. Well, I thought that from a from a finals football <clears throat> point of view. I thought that the, what, the, one of the teams that impressed me most um, over the weekend was GWS. I don't know if you've caught yep. that game. Yep. Yeah. Um, but they played a, brand, a real finals brand of football. It was tough. It was uncompromising and it was relentless. And um, they um, just seem to me to have developed a bit harder edge than what they've had in previous years. And um, uh, they got a couple of really good players back. Again, Fien, as you said, uh, same as Melbourne, they took took a punt on a few players coming back in, and I just thought they um, they looked like a really really determined outfit. Yeah, agree yeah, with that, right. Pete. Sorry, go. And talk. they lo- and they lost a player early on. Well, not a player, a bloody champion. Yeah. What were you going to say, yeah. Donkey? Oh, I was going to say that I think they um, they uh, they've had to fight a lot harder this year than they had the last couple of years to get to where they are. And I think you're right about that harder edge and that and and uh, you know busting your way through packs and busting your way through the competition to get to where you are is a lot tougher than it is to sort of sell at the front. I think sometimes, and uh, they're not going to get uh, as much stage fright in a prelim final as they probably had in the last couple of ones. So, um, and they've just got top quality cattle. And well, if, they uh, get, if they get to another one, don't they? Um, that, this will be their third prelim in a row. Yep. Yeah, and so you'd you think that they would have had to have learned something, and, and they'll cop Richmond again. They're on the Richmond side of the draw, 
So they'll cop Richmond the MCG. The difference, though, this year is that they'll go and play Collingwood at the MCG this week. So they'll have a game on the MCG, um, you know, against a hostile crowd. There won't be a lot of difference in terms of playing Collingwood and Richmond. Um, yep. So they'll have that almost like a dress rehearsal uh, for that for that big prelim final. And um, I don't know. I just got a funny feeling they um, they're gonna they might have a bit of a shout. I think it's down to personnel for them. I mean, how, they, along with us, they've probably been the hardest hit with injuries this year, not just numbers but quality. And yeah. losing Kelly um, and the signs, he's going to have an arthroscope tomorrow or he had one today, I'm not quite sure. but Yeah, they've listed him as the test. Yeah, you'd, you'd, so, have, to, you'd have to suggest assault. that. Yeah, uh, you know. It, it, he'd be hard-pressed to get up this week, even if the knees are right, getting up. In two days from an arthroscope, it's you know he's going to have some pain there, and yeah, I mean the inclusion of Toby Green is an excellent one. I think I think he's very underrated in terms of the influence he has. He's a bit of X factor for them. Um, but you're right, Pete. They were very very solid, and they they polax Sydney. They mm. like Sydney uh, a hardened finals campaigners, and they they smashed them. Yeah. What, what do we think but about it's, Richmond? But it's the slow, it was the slowness of that Sydney midfield. They just did not want to run and chase. There was every uh, the commentators kept going, "Oh, Buddy needs to do this, and the forwards need to do that." And I'm watching the game, just going, "No, their midfielders need to pull their freaking finger out." That's what lost Sydney the game. They were not interested, or they couldn't go with GWS's midfield. They're fall. They're, I think they've fallen off a cliff. I think they'll fall even further next year. Well, it's a question of depth, I think, for Sydney. They, I mean, yeah. there's another team that sold the farm uh, for a few players over the last couple of years, and um, I, I think they lack midfield depth. Uh, Hanabry has had a troubled season. Uh, Lukey Park has been very inconsistent. Um, you know, they, they've got, uh, obviously, Isaac Heaney is a, just a star, but they don't have a lot of depth in that midfield rotation, and... Uh, they've got some good workhorses in their in the back half of their twenty two, but not uh, not anyone that's going to shoot the lights out. So I think you're right, Nick. I, I, but we say we write Sydney off at our peril because they just keep bouncing back every season. I do Fane, you were going to ask about Richmond. I mm. saw that game as well. I, that just looked to me like every other Richmond Friday night, Thursday night, MCG Richmond game I've seen for about the last year and a half. Yep. Hawthorne annoyed the hell out of me. <clears throat> I was very the, surprised the, 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 with how Hawthorne or uh, well, how Richmond were able to scared. subdue. Oh, exactly right, Nikki. Uh, Hawthorne played with no freedom whatsoever. Um, a couple of and their they champs made stupid were down. Decisions. And, yep, agree. Um, Ber- Burgoyne did not want to put his body in. I think he got a hit early on and then just went nope. Um, and he pulled out of a couple of contests that we've seen him go in for um, before. And like we then and extract that ball out and deliver it with class, and he was just like, "No, okay, you can get it and run away." Um, it was, I mean, the ball wasn't bouncing Hawthorne's way. That that kind of you have one of those games where nothing's going your way. You kind of anticipate, and it just doesn't. And then the opposition team they anticipate and it lands their way, but they were making poor decisions. They were waiting for somebody else to do things, or they were in two minds. It, it was very un like and it just seemed that they got scared. I think um, Hawthorne had a – of all the teams battling for uh, spots in the eight, I, I think that Hawthorne, my, if my memory serves me correctly, had just about – perhaps apart from Geelong and those last two games they had, over the last probably six or seven weeks had a reasonably comfortable run in. Yeah, they did. And I just, wa- I just wonder whether their um, – their, their fixture may have contributed to their lofty top four position and whether they really are as um, as good a team as what that position says it is. I think, you know, it, it does show that the fixture plays a big part in the makeup of the final eight because we've seen that the season itself is a war of attrition and it depends very much on form coming in, uh, you know, the last six weeks coming into finals. And if you're a team... That's been on, you know, in that mid six fixture that is can go either way. Um, you know, you can have a very soft run into the into the finals. And I think who was it? Was it? There was a team last year that had a similar 
um, run. I can't remember who it was, but it, it, when you when you've got a fixture that doesn't have that play everyone once and then you know play your, your double ups after that, um, it can result in a very lopsided fixture. And I think you're right, Pete. I think Hawthorne did benefit from a very easy run over the last six weeks, and it probably it may well have overstated uh, their position. I certainly overestimated them. I actually thought they were the team that were going to give Richmond a, a, a run for their money, and they didn't never look like it. Mm. But to be fair, I think barely, over the last eight, you know, over twelve months now, barely any teams look like giving Richmond a run for their money at the MCG. I think Geelong got close to them this year. That's probably about it. Collingwood did as well until they had a few injuries. So I, I think Collingwood Richmond would be very interesting. Well, I think mm. either of the co-tenants will give them a bit of a push uh, because they, you know, they will have their own home ground factor as well. Melbourne or Collingwood yep. will give them a push. Um, but re- if you're a Richmond player at the moment, you're riding on a fairly good wave of confidence. I reckon uh, yeah. you'd be feeling a little bit invincible. Yeah, and they seem to do a really good rope a dope strategy too. They sort of wear you out and play a bit of keep you off in the first half, and then massively come home with about a quarter and a bit to go. You can just imagine the, the excitement in Melbourne at the prospect of a Richmond-Melbourne grand final um, for the traditionalists over there, and then it turns out that there's a West Coast GWS final. I reckon you'd get tickets. <laughs> <for tickets. laughs> yeah, you'd be able to walk up, I reckon. I reckon you could walk up on the day, and I reckon you'd, <laughs> you'd, you'd get into one of those posh tents for probably <laughs> no, cut, no, for a couple of hundred bucks. Is, all those corporate tickets would be sold. Oh, yeah. But none of them, they would go for the drinks outside and none of them bother coming inside. No. That all stay, they'll, that'll stay outside. There'll be a Royal, Royal Commission of the State of Football within about two minutes. If that happened, if those two teams <laughs> play the grand final, I'm going over with 500 bucks and I reckon I'm getting into a tent. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, now, speaking of West Coast, how did we uh, rate their performance against Collingwood? Oh, look, I thought it was a brilliant game of football. I don't know if you saw the game. It was a very exciting game, really good brand of football. And um, and they were very, very good. I I really thought that in the last quarter, Collingwood had them. Mm, um, and, um, yeah, first half of the last quarter. Yep, I really thought they had them. And when um, Dugowie kicked that, that goal that put them, you know, I can't remember, maybe six, one or two goals up, I, I really thought then that, that was um, they'd go on with it. But to West Coast credit, um, Josh Kennedy had a big, last quarter and Darling had a big last quarter and um, and it was it was mostly actually McGovern they finally managed to get McGovern away from Maine and the way Collingwood were working quite well to keep McGovern either honest or out of the play yep he he finally managed to get little bits of breaks and that was he was doing that drive which then brought in Darling which then brought yep. in Kennedy no, good point, Nikki. And and I think, um, you know, West Coast are another team that have been, um, you know, beset by injuries this year to key players and uh, they've managed to um, um, keep themselves in that position where they're into a prelim final. And I think that, you know, another couple of weeks for Josh Kennedy and I think that, um, yeah. you know, they'll be, um, you know, they're a different side when he played. I mean, we, we he didn't play. I mean, you no. think when we, sorry, when, when we played them, yep. Kennedy didn't play, Lacroix didn't play. I don't think Darling played either, actually, that game. Um, you know, when they've got the big forwards up and running, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a good side. They'll be hard to beat. I don't think they'll get beaten over there. I think that no. they'll they'll end up in Melbourne um, on grand final day. I don't think that either Hawthorne or Melbourne will beat West Coast over there. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be quite confident. But I think that if West Coast have to play Richmond um, in the grand final... Pfft, you, I, hey, just, I wonder what the a, ratings would actually be. Yeah. I think it would be one of the lowest, lower rating AFL. If that happened, I don't think there's going to be a lot of neutrals that would turn in. Mind you, there aren't they, aren't they two two wins from two games at the G this year, West Coast? Yeah, I think they might be. At the G or that. in think, Victoria? At the G, I think they're two from two at the G this year. I'll look it up. I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to mention too is, do you reckon Tom Diday would have had as a uh, lack of influence on a on a game in a final as the uh, eventual rising star winner did? <laughs> <laughs> come on, mate. Come on. 
AFL. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Yep, the, two the, wins at the MCG. So they played wins. the they played the Magpies in round seventeen, and that was one hundred two to sixty seven. The earlier one was against Carlton, right, um, okay. which was a, a 79-69, but that was only in round five. Yeah, okay. But that so they, that latter one, that round seventeen. That's a good win, isn't it? That is a good win. So they got they have got some form on the G. Um, so you know, I don't know stranger things have happened, but uh, if Richmond. If Richmond get past, I think GWS will get past Collingwood, and I think that if Richmond get past GWS, they'll go on and win it. But um, um, as I said, I'm 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 just a little bit hopeful that we will spoil the Melbourne party. That'd be funny. It really would because you've got some Melbourne powerhouse clubs, you know, Melbourne, Collingwood, and Richmond in the in that series. And if they all bowed out, and we had a an interstate final, uh, that'd be. Oof. Some kind of hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> I'd watch just to <laughs> piss them off. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously uh, this week we've got the knockout finals. We've got the Hawthorne versus Melbourne on the Friday night at the G. Uh, I don't think any of us really are on the Hawthorne bandwagon. Any, I've certainly jumped off. No, I'm going to pick Hawthorne just because I, <laughs> just to help us, because <laughs> we've got that Melbourne pick. So they need to finish lower. <laughs> I'm going to go for Hawthorne uh, because they've got actually quite a good record against Melbourne and um, beat them comfortably when they played them during the year. And I think that they just have a grinding sort of a game that will uh, um, that that uh, Melbourne won't be able to withstand. So I'm going to go for the Hawks to bounce back. Ooh, donkey, what do you reckon? Yeah, I um, I, I agree with that assessment. Also, I think Hawthorne play quite sporadic <laughs> football. Like they're they're on one week and off the other next. So they're probably a little bit off in that last quarter, and they'll be. Hurting, and I still think they've got some pretty decent talent. So if they can keep the ball off Melbourne, then they're gonna they're gonna they'll outsystem them. Well, I didn't read that one right. <laughs> I've gone from being the <laughs> I've gone from being the only one on the Hawks last week to the only one not on them this week. I, I reckon the D's will be too strong through the midfield. I reckon they've got some real quality workhorses there. And Nick, I think you're right. The only Achilles heel will be kicking a winning score. But uh, if they get enough of the peel, I reckon they'll get over the line. Saturday, we've got Collingwood and the Giants. That's a real tasty game if the Giants can get up and bring their A game to the G. Yeah, a quick, sorry, quickly, just on the Hawthorne, Stratton out too will hurt them. Yeah, uh, it will. He's a very good, yeah, very yeah. good footballer. Um, yeah, no, I'm going to go to the Giants there. I think um, I think, I, I think Collingwood are a really, really good side. I think injuries have hurt them. They're another side uh, that have uh, been uh, had a difficult year with injury. Um, the, th- the four sides that have really... Had difficult years with injury this year. Of you know, West Coast, Collingwood, GWS, and us. And interesting that those um, those other three teams seem to get their way through it. But um, that's for another another day. Um, I think that um, Collingwood have been a really really good side this year. I've been really impressed with them. And I think that they've got um, you know they get to their full deck on the park uh, next year. I think they'll be a really really uh, difficult proposition. But I just got a feeling that GWS um, have been building. And um, I think that they'll get past them. Don't. Uh, I think it's going to be a draw in regular time, and Jira is going to win by two goals in overtime. That's a big call. That's yeah. a big call. You got money on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd pay a bit, I reckon. That would. Um, I don't trust the Giants at the G yet. Um, I reckon that I reckon they've got a real steeliness about them, Pete. You're right. This season. Uh, particularly this final series. They showed that against Sydney last week, but uh, I still like the Maggies at the G, so I'm tipping two MCG tenants to win uh, Collingwood on Saturday and Melbourne on Friday. Um, uh. I'm with the other boys on Collingwood. I quite, I've quite liked um, the way that they've played, um, and I think Kelly out is a big hurt for GWS. Even if he does play, um, I think he'll be restricted. And it's the spaces that I think will get to GWS. Hmm. Uh, the one thing I reckon GWS suffer from uh, on the G is I reckon Jeremy Cameron sometimes gets a little bit lost. Uh, it's a big forward line for him to cover up there. And uh, I reckon sometimes he can be taken out of play just because of the wide, wide, the, the width of the ground, I should say. 
Um, Has he done anything since he's come back from his report? No, he didn't play. La- he didn't play bad last week. I didn't think. He hasn't really been that effective, though. He kicks his two or three goals, I think. Yeah. The one that's actually, I think, sailing past him is Harry Himmelberg. He's, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. He he's been terrific, and we certainly Hamish was on. It was as always. He was on the button when he wanted to uh, to uh, pick uh, Harry Himmelberg. With the with the D Day pick, but um, um, he uh, he got outbid, so um, uh, he was right on the money with Harry. Very very good footballer. Yep, yep. All right. Well, uh, Nikki, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> So this is a special cockwumbling edition of <laughs> Macca's Sweets and Smacks. <laughs> Go for it. I two two things that two segments that both you know amount to the same thing in the <laughs> end. Well, the one thing I did like was that that final between West Coast and Collingwood because my God, we needed a good game of football. So thank you to both of those teams. The then the cockwumble that's kind of come out of that is, of course, Eddie Maguire because he can't help himself. <laughs> Whose dog was that? It was perfect timing. Um, so I, I think Eddie definitely gets a nomination. My other nomination, um, came out of that game, which is all to do with the commentators. Now, I think that if you were going to commentate on radio or on television, if this is your job, I think they need to do a test at the start of the year that they actually know the rules, that they've actually looked at the rule book and they've read it. Because if they are being on TV or on radio as an expert and they cannot actually know that there is a difference in terms of if a ball hits an umpire when it's near the goals as opposed to it hitting in the ground, which came in, as somebody pointed out, back in 2014, none of the commentators knew that the umpires were actually correct in calling for a score review that the ball was going to hit the post if the umpire hadn't been in the way. They actually got that correct, but most people watching were thinking they got it wrong Nikki, because the commentators kept going, no, they're wrong. Nikki, you know as well as I do, if it's not on the DVD at the start of the season, then the commentators have got, got no, no idea because they can't read, they can only watch TV. So, <laughs> you know. And even then we know they're not actually watching the vision that's being yeah. shown to us. They're looking through binoculars and calling something else. Well, they're just too busy having a chat. Well, and just on a on a serious note, even though we have taken the piss a bit, if you were watching the NFL, you would have those the commentators in the NFL would be are there over every freaking connotation of every rule known oh, God, to man, yes. and that is the most over officiated sport on the planet. So they've you're got right. a referee and an umpire and two judges. Yeah, they got blokes back in NFL house doing reviews. I mean, we do lack expertise. Um, in in the commentary, even the good commentators like McAvaney and whatnot, in terms good in terms of you know knowledgeable, um, we we don't have that expertise, uh, and we deserve better as fans. Uh, the AFL is getting turning into a complex sport. Uh, the AFL are trying to make it a more complex sport with you know the off season and all the rest of it. Um, Channel Seven needs to step up to the plate. And that's hilarious because you've quoted the NFL and we know that's what Gil idolises. And yet the, their commentators, um, they get it right. They really yeah. do. They do know all those angles. Fadi um, Magic just, makes a comment about uh, Bartel and I thought he was excellent actually. Yeah. No nonsense yeah, he was actually good. and very, very, very good in the way that he spoke. I did like Montagna until he was proved himself a, a proper St Kilda player. Um <laughs> Oh, God, there's the culture at that club. Uh, The other um, part of this is... So Gil's idolising of the NFL bringing in the fucking conference system into the AFLW. No. You've got 10 teams. I'm sorry, you make it a 12-week season. The players themselves have already said they're willing to start playing earlier. 
So you're, you're not impeding into it. You, you actually started earlier. You get every team to play each other. And then you have a two-week final. You have a top four. Done. Not this stupid conference system. Because the only reason conferences are in the NFL are because it came historically out of two separate leagues. And there is inequality in the NFL in terms of those conferences. You have one side of it has always been slightly more dominant than the other. So the AFL, well, we've already given it to Gil. For he's, he is the cockwomble of the year, but that was just ridiculous. Mm. Uh, just on that, uh, Nikki, and just because, you know, we don't have you on often, so I'll ask, well, how would you see the Serena Williams thing? There are very much double standards in relation oh, to her. Come on. Oh. Yes. Well, no, on. no, 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 oh, there Jesus. are. No, no, let, 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 let me finish. Bullshit. Don't even get no, started. Let me, let me finish. Let me finish. There are double standards when it comes to her. She did lose her temper. She did deserve warnings, etc. But the problem becomes that the focus afterwards is then all on her, come not on Naomi come Osaka. On who actually played a brilliant game and Serena was actually very good at the end. She told the crowd to stop no, booing. She wasn't. That was well, self-serving she'd, she'd rubbish. The, no, no, she'd, no, no. She'd whip the crowd up into a friend. She, she had to do that. No, she had a juice to do doesn't. that because, well, she'd she whip the crowd up into a friend with her behavior. It was disgraceful. Go. Go. No, Serena it's, has form on this. Serena has form she on this. She does have when, form. When Stam Soza well, beat, but, beat her, she had hissy fits all during that game as well. Let let me. What, what I, what like I want to ask. What I want to ask is is that who was she? If she's standing up for for women, who was she standing up for when she threatened a lineswoman in two thousand and nine by saying she was going to stuff a ball down her throat? Who was she sticking up for when she threatened a lineswoman again in two thousand and eleven, saying that she was ugly on the inside? Right. So this is so she is a brat. She yeah. is an entitled brat. Entitled. Brat. Pretty much most of them are. Um, no, you don't. No, 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 no. You don't see it, Roger Federer like, act like that. You don't see Novak Identity Djokovic. No, oh, no. Oh yes, Federer has. Come on. All Federer has. Federer, Federer, and Ramos. That that chair umpire. He's he's Federer has actually threatened that chair umpire as well. Come Nadal on, has told Nadal has actually told that chair umpire before. You will never, never umpire me again. So there is fall with a lot of the top players in that particular chair umpire. Federer um, has as well, and he hasn't had the fines as strongly as others. There was a case um, of a, another female, I've forgotten her name, another female tennis player who earlier even, this I'm year even, even, picked even, up just... her racket and actually destroyed it on the umpire's chair. Now, she did not get a fine. It doesn't matter. Do you know what? It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. One iota, a lot of yeah, because maybe because maybe she was on her first warning, because you get you actually get a warning. Now she did that, three. That should she, be more than a warning. Did, if, if you're doing no, that to not. the umpire's it's a, chair, it's a code violation. It's a code violation. If it's your first one, then it's a warning. That's the rule. Now she had her first warning when she was coaching and she was cheating. Okay, so that was found to be proven because the coach came out and admitted it afterwards. So she was cheating as much as yeah, she wanted to do. deny it. Well, that doesn't matter. She's, that doesn't matter at all. She was doing it and she got a violation and she got a warning. So then she goes and she breaks her racket. Well, then that's the second violation. So she gets her point deducted. Then she goes and calls the umpire a cheat and a liar. So, of course, she gets no, she the third one. No, no, she, she called him a thief. thief. No, she called, thief. called him a thief. Okay, that's, that, that's much better, a thief and a liar. And so she gets her third violation. And so it's a, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a graduated thing. And so you, you can't compare it to another situation unless you actually know whether that was a warning or whether it was a second violation. I, I don't watch tennis um, as much anymore um, as what I used to. But um, the problem I've always had with it is that there is a lack of consistency regarding particular players and other things. I, the whole thing about that coaching, every single one of them do it. And, and I don't understand why they can't. They they should be able to coach their players. But this is the, this is there. the thing because I, I just think so, it's ridiculous. So it's, it's been a rule forever. It's been a rule forever. But now because she's been caught out on it, they want to change the rule. She it's just she, ridiculous. 
She's one of the best players in the world over the last 20 years. It was a Grand oh, Slam final yeah. and she chucked a massive hissy fit. This is not over the top at all. Like she needs to think, she needs to take like accountability for her actions. She she did this. Nobody else did this. This was nothing to do with whether she was a woman or not. This is to do with she's one of the best players in the world over a long period of time and chucked a massive tansy. If you saw Michael Schumacher get out of his car in his heyday and start punching on with, you know, another driver or, you know, kicking the crap out of one of his, you know, wheel putter on a guys. Like it would oh, be mean, a good story too. So Jamie, Jamie Wincup, who for years has always had the nickname of Winer Cup because it was always everybody else's fault, and never his. Yeah, um, but that's not the point, Nikki. The point is, yeah, but, here, no, no, there's players. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Best athletes, in the world. So, best can in I the just world. say, yeah, and and people do lose their cool, yeah. and they do, and you can understand that. So Nikki, Nikki, she is not a life. young player playing no, her not. first Grand Slam. She is a seasoned veteran. Possibly yes. the best female player ever to have played the game. She's won 28-odd Grand Slam titles. She's not entitled to use I lost my call as an excuse. And not only that, she is not entitled to then make it an issue of sexism and discrimination because that is deflecting that is deflecting no, will, from her behaviour. I, I will bring up the sexism regarding terminology that's often used and there, and there is in terms of she brought up some... the fact that she had a daughter and her daughter shouldn't uh, see her yeah, I did. Lose. well that's what i'm talking about don't make I, excuses I don't for that, it but the, i un- no the... i understand where she's coming from there because you do realize she oh, nearly died giving give birth it up. To that oh, who gives a shit i nearly died walking she's across the road the, the road. other day she no, because that use... comes into her psyche at no, the moment and where she's at. No, 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 She tried no. to use her yeah. status. She tried to use her status as one of the best players in the world, uh, the best player ever really, in the world. She was playing badly. Yeah, the play, and she's playing better. And she tried to intimidate the referee. Exactly. Well, that's what she tried to do. She exactly. tried to use her status to try and intimidate the referee. And then when it didn't, that didn't, and because something didn't go her way, she tucks the tanty and calls him a thief. And then when there's backlash, it's suddenly sexism. This is, I am, like, I am, I am all over uh, stamping that sort of crap out of the sport when it's there. But people doing this sort of behaviour and pulling it, it actually makes it harder for everybody else who's trying to do the right thing. Exactly. And there would have been, uh, you know, hundreds of tennis-playing women all over the world thinking, well, shit, I've got a daughter, and that doesn't excuse me if I behave like that. Serena Williams is supposedly the figurehead of women's tennis and arguably women's sport, and she can't hold herself together when she's playing badly well enough to actually carry herself with some grace against a player who is playing in her first Grand Slam final, who, who won her first Grand Slam tournament, Serena Williams should be handing over her, her runners-up check to that player and saying, here you go, I owe you this because I've taken all your publicity and probably cost you a fortune in endorsements. Just a joke. You can't defend it, Nikki. I'm sorry. It's, it's indefensible. Uh, look, I... I haven't seen all of it and that's my problem in in being able to talk about it because I didn't watch all the game. I've only seen bits and pieces and and you get different information coming from all over the other ways. So it is very hard to make a judgment and, and, but I do know she has dealt with some other things that have been quite strong in terms of a double standard. We all do um, shit. Respect to her and others. We all deal with shit, and she's got millions do. of dollars in the bank and 28 Grand Slam titles in her pocket, so she should be able to deal with it a little bit better than most, Nikki. Look, the majority of the time she does handle herself with grace, mm, so... That's because she's winning. Anyway, what else anyway, have we got? moving along. I no, knew that would get a rise. <laughs> <laughs> so who's that cockwomble? <laughs> Nikki oh, for defending Serena, Serena Williams. <laughs> no, she's not in the AFL. Uh, well, pro- oh, how about Terry Wallace for saying, and Damien Barrett for saying that we wouldn't get more than a, a high second for uh, Mitch McGovern and that M- McGovern had some dirt if he didn't get drafted and all this sort of crap. Yeah, that'll do. Trying to undermine... The crows in uh, in their bid to get a half decent South Australian lad in the in the draft just goes on anyway. Nikki, who is it? 
Uh, well, we've the AFL's kind of won it overall. Um, I, As they always do. I, I thought the uh, the commentators, though, oh, God, they shitted me off. All right. I mean, and, and cha- Channel 7. Just Why don't we just commentary. make it? We'll just make it an all-played well. What do you reckon? <laughs> anyway, look, that uh, wraps us up for tonight. A little bit shorter than usual, but obviously no crows to talk about. Don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, aflcrowcast.com as well. We've, uh, we're in the process of revamping our website. We have a new member section there now. Uh, there's a forum going up. There's going to be tons of other things happening on our website over the summer months. Uh, so check it out every now and again and see how we're going. Obviously, you can listen to our podcasts and watch our podcast video feeds on our website as well. No Sunday wrap, obviously, as usual, but we'll be back next uh, Tuesday for Tuesday Night Live. We did get a bit of an apology from Macro. I didn't have time to read it, but uh, thankfully he's okay, and we'll be back next week as well. Donkey, thanks very much for joining us. Nikki, thank you very much for joining us again for a bit of a, uh, a blast from the past on Tuesday Night Live. <laughs> and Pete, as always, thanks for keeping us on the straight and narrow, mate. Thanks, everyone, on Facebook and Spreaker. We will see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye.